Okay, well, Andrew, thank you so much for uh, joining us today uh, and excited to discuss uh, Coho Collective Kitchens in uh, a bit more detail on this uh, on this interview. But I wonder if maybe if to begin, uh, you could give us uh, a little bit of backstory, maybe the elevator pitch for Coho. Thank you for having me, James. Um, Coho was born five years ago. Uh, we operate in the shared kitchen industry, uh, or perhaps you've heard about it as the ghost kitchen industry. What we do is provide uh, facilities and support to help small entrepreneurs grow. Uh, so we build out large scale commercial kitchens uh, and then rent those out to smaller members so that they can um, really supercharge their business and take it to the next level. Uh, at Coho, we're really about community and hospitality. So bringing amazing food and allowing um, entrepreneurs to really succeed and grow. Okay, fantastic. Uh, interesting to hear, you know, the high level. And I've definitely heard you know, about Ghost Kitchens and we'll, uh, we'll maybe get some more into that later in the, uh, in the interview. But I'm wondering if you can, you know, wind back the years. You see, you know, five years ago, uh, Coho started you bring us back to uh what 2018 uh and tell us you what was it at that time that led the company to you know coming together and being founded and maybe you know what was the opportunity you saw in the market at that moment yeah absolutely great question um our company was founded in 2018 by my co-founder and myself amr harash we identified a significant uh gap in the market uh, for shared kitchen space and realized almost immediately the immense potential for growth that we could help drive. Amr and I have known each other for over 15 years and we've always wanted to find a way to work together and this is what did it. Um, we uh, actually started a small investment fund where we were looking at small local food businesses and beverage businesses, something both of us were very passionate about. Um, and very quickly it hit us on the head that um, these companies that were pitching to us all had the same challenge. And those challenges were that it was really hard to find a space to operate in the, in the city. Um, uh, in Vancouver and large cities, this can be a very hard thing for an entrepreneur to do, to find a facility, to build that facility, and then to operate while they're trying to de deliver, uh, sorry, deliver and develop just an amazing business on their own. It's just something that they don't, shouldn't have to deal with while also focusing on growing their business. It was a really a big light bulb moment for us at that time. Um, and we built our first kitchen within six months while both Amrit and I were also working our full-time jobs um, and had it filled within a few months after that. So at that moment, we knew that we had something strong. We left our previous employment and we were off to the races for this business. Um, things have changed dramatically in that last five years, as you can imagine, especially within the food business. So some of the things that we really saw is five years ago, um, Uber Eats, DoorDash, Skip the Dishes, they were just starting out. Um, and it was something that potentially you had heard about, but you weren't using on a regular basis. Obviously, COVID was a massive acceleration to that. And COVID was a time for our company that we had to just race to keep up with demand. Uh, and thankfully, what we're seeing is that customer behavior since that time has not changed. The rise of that um, delivery network has not gone away. Um, there's other just some like more macroeconomic things that are really driving the success of our business um, in the difficulty it is to find space to operate in big cities, especially as a small entrepreneur, especially uh, if you haven't built up that um, reputation uh, so that landlords will take you seriously. Uh, so it takes it takes six months to a year to build out some of these facilities. Um, and that's something that these small business would just be crippled by. Um, and it's that building knowledge that I wouldn't be even able to start if I didn't have my business partner who was from that world um, being able to support that. So just finally to say there is that we identified that market, we captured it, and then we are off to the races. And that's why we are sprinting uh, for that growth. We've seen over a 59% CAGR growth in our company in the last three years, and we continue to be overwhelmed by the opportunity that we have in front of us. Okay, excellent. Yeah, it sounds like uh, you know, supply can't keep up with demand when, you know, when you're when you looking at that sector. And, and interesting to hear how maybe uh, COVID accelerated some of those trends. Um, you mentioned that yourself and uh, Amrit, the other co-founder of Coho, uh, you know, go way back. I'm wondering if you could tell us, uh, you know, maybe a bit about both of your uh, backgrounds. You know how you how you met, what uh, your experience you have working, uh, you know, in this in this kind of tech uh, sector, and you know, maybe what expertise you uh, you bring to the team. Absolutely, good question. Um, as well as we are supported by a great team, and I'll talk about a couple of additional people on our team as well. Um, so Emer and I did meet 15 years ago on a volunteering. 
uh, thing. Uh, so Amrit is very passionate in the volunteer uh, community, uh, and I had the opportunity to meet him through one of those uh, sessions, and we became fast friends after that. Um, and what's really great between our relationship is that our skill sets are almost entirely different that we're able to leverage from one another. So myself, um, I come from over 17 years working at Electronic Arts, the video game company. Um, mm -hmm. I was in senior management focusing on operations and finance um, at the time. Um, and I had the opportunity to, to work around the world, um, including my last stint was five years uh, helping to lead some of the European operations um, based in Spain. And I was just surrounded by um, just a, a time in Spain that was um, uh, really accelerating on, on entrepreneurship as they were going through some challenges with uh, employment and macroeconomic conditions in, in their yeah. country. Um, so just seeing that as well as the amazing food that's on offered in Europe and wanting to come back to Vancouver and, and, and help support those that vision uh, back at home. Um, after EA, I started two different tech companies. Um, one, I was able to start locally in Vancouver, uh, and then one uh, in Europe, um, which is still going strong um, with a team that I founded from my MBA program. Um, that is one of the fastest growing healthcare apps in Europe right now. Um, so I have a lot of experience in tech. And what I really love about the Coho business is that we're able to leverage those operations, the streamline. Uh, sorry, streamline our, our, our processes, um, have a very strong tech platform that um, uh, that props up the overall organization. Um, but it, you can also feel it, right? We have bricks and mortar locations. We see real entrepreneurs going through these challenges. Uh, and it's something that coming from a tech experience, you don't always see that customer um, immediately. And it's really nice to see um, how much passion is going behind the food that all of us get to eat around the city. Um, Amrit, entirely different skill set. Uh, he's a entrepreneur at heart, um, built his own business, um, uh, building commercial and residential uh, buildings, and did that for largely his whole life. Um, he brings a wealth of experience, and his job at um, Coho is primarily about building. When I'm talking about building, I'm talking about in a wider sense. He's building our buildings, of course. We need those to, to help grow, um, but he's also building our long-term vision. He's building the relationships that are so powerful around us, uh, and that building and growing uh, phase um, to allow uh, myself to, to operate that in an effective way is absolutely critical to our business. We're also supported by two other strong C-suite members. Uh, Michael Yam, who's our CFO, uh, he came from working as a VP of finance at a publicly traded cannabis company, and we had the opportunity to work with him prior to promoting him to CFO uh, for about a year as our senior director of finance. So obviously, he brings a ton of experience on making sure that we're financially um, uh, strong in our and, and that foundation is there in the business, but he's also a great deal guy. Um, so as we'll talk about a little bit later on, there's there's things always happening at Coho as we are looking to find different opportunities, whether that be growing our organic business or looking at some acquisitions, and and that's where his experience and skill set really comes in strong. Uh, and then finally, our team was very well balanced by um, a woman named Jennifer Chan, uh, who is our CMO. Um, a little bit um, different than a traditional CS, uh, CS, CMO, uh, she is entirely focusing on our revenue growth of the business. So her team is aggressively driving the sales activity, uh, our market expansion, and our reputation. Ultimately, Coho's name is synonymous with shared kitchens in Canada, and that's largely because of Jen and her team's tireless efforts in that regard. Um, I should probably also talk about our board of directors. Um, our board of directors is something that we've um, been honored to have some amazing people come together to face this challenge together of helping small businesses grow and supercharge that opportunity. Uh, there's three people on our on our board outside of Amrit and myself. Uh, the first to talk about is Alex McDonald. Uh, he's our chair of our audit committee. Uh, Alex is the CFO of Enthusiast Gaming, a company that grew from the TSX venture all the way to the NASDAQ. Um, he obviously brings a ton of experience financially, uh, cares a ton about what the work that we're doing, is able to really provide us that kind of forward looking, here's what's about to happen to you in, in a year, in two years, because his company has gone through it recently. Um, Justin Morell is the COO of the Top Table Restaurant Group, uh, which if you're based in Vancouver, you probably know those restaurants, um, whether it be in Vancouver and Whistler, uh, one of Vancouver's uh, most premier restaurant groups. He brings a ton of experience, both commercially and strategically, strategically that we can help expand out. 
And then finally, Yuri Fulmer is a very successful entrepreneur and VC in Vancouver. He joined our board in February. Uh, he's really focused on the strength of the businesses that operate within our spaces. So if we can help our members be successful, um, then we can really be more successful ourselves as they require additional space to grow and services to grow as well. Um, so really uh, love the well-roundedness of the, the support of the board itself and, of course, the passion that they bring to business. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds like, you know, from uh, capital markets to entrepreneurship to food, you know, you have all the right people in place to, you know, deliver deliver an impact. And it sounds like Vancouver is, uh, you know, a really good, uh, a really good region to be, uh, to be building out a, a business like this. I'm wondering if we could maybe talk a little bit about how, uh, you know, the business model operates, you know, how do you work with, uh, you know, local kind of food entrepreneurs who are looking to scale their business uh, and you know, how do you ultimately make a profit from that? Excellent. Good question. Um, really what we're trying to do is understand what these businesses need. Um, as you can imagine, we have over a hundred companies that are operating in our spaces and they all need something different. A lot of these companies are solo entrepreneurs or, or a couple effectively doing the work itself. And you can imagine that running a food business where you have to source the food, produce the food, market the food, sell the food, and then maybe get to your, uh, your financing of the, of the project itself. It, there's a lot on the shoulders of somebody. So the first thing that we do is just immediately take away a lot of pain. Um, you can start immediately at Coho within two weeks of signing an application and an application process for us is that you call us submit your application online. We go through and make sure that you're the right fit for the kitchen and vice versa. Um, and really making sure that we can deliver on what we promise for the spaces that we offer. Um, what overnight, just joining our kitchens, what you get is you, you don't have to wait for permits. You don't have to spend any money on capital infrastructure outside of like small, uh, small wares and the food that you have itself. Um, you're not under financial strain before you even start, which is one of the main challenges in the food businesses that even before you open the doors, you run out of money. Um, so you don't have to do any of that. Um, that's kind of the basic like air, food and water, um, that we provide people, but it's that next level that I believe like makes our companies, uh, especially sticky. We have about a 98% retention rate. People don't leave us, um, which is great because they're able to expand within our flexible spaces. Um, so most of the spaces that do become available immediately get snapped up by one of our existing members. And as we open new locations, we just opened a new location in East Vancouver. Um, and it was hundred percent capacity at opening because we had so many people that were ready ready to move up and expand within our network itself. Wow. Could you tell us maybe a little bit about what that process looks like, you know, expanding within Vancouver and opening new locations? Uh, you know, what, what is the work behind the scenes that goes into those, uh, you know, grand openings? Yeah, good question. Uh, there's, uh, I guess, two major things is one is identifying the needs of our customers. Uh, we have over 500 companies on the wait list right now. Um, these are people that are waiting just in just in Western Canada alone, waiting to get into a space. Um, and it's it's a competitive uh, landscape to get into our kitchens itself. Um, but for that reason, we know very well what people are looking for. You can imagine designing a kitchen for the needs of 100 people. That's really hard to do. Um, so what we're trying to do is instead is understand as much as possible about the people that can operate in the space and then offer them a service that kind of um, and a service and a facility uh, that can support those needs of them. Once we've identified that, which we know very well now what people are needing, um, we get to building. Um, so what we're primarily looking for on the building side are turnkey facilities. These might be old food manufacturing facilities. They might be caterers, things like that. It just is able to keep us our, our costs down and our speed to market faster. For example, the East Vancouver location that I was talking about was formerly a fish manufacturing facility. Um, so we had to switch that to a food manufacturing facility, um, but it wasn't a big ask. It already had all the coolers and things like that that you require to have that space. Ultimately for us, it's about reducing uh, CapEx on our own side as well as that speed to market because if you get into a um like a just walls in a warehouse that you have to build from um that is a year of permitting time plus another year of building and that's just something for our business and that wait list that we cannot wait for so we're just finding faster ways to go while also doing some of those larger projects but they're they're just going in the background while we're also waiting to do this 
And then finally, as soon as we know that the place is going to be open uh, within a, a, a specific range, uh, we go out to that wait list and tell people like who wants to be in these spaces. We start pre-selling the locations um, and uh, taking deposits. So from an investor standpoint, they can feel strong that any location that we're opening is going to be a good financial decision. Each of our locations operates at about a 30 to 40 percent EBITDA margin. Um, so it's a very strong prospect. Essentially, the model on the coho side is find businesses, sorry, find locations that we can open fast uh, and then open as many as possible of them uh, in large markets because the demand is there. And I'm talking about Vancouver, but we put up a wait list, um, sorry, we put up a landing page in Toronto and we had over 2,000 companies apply within a one month period. So the demand in Canada, in North America is just overwhelming as people are looking for more cost-effective solutions to help grow their business. Yeah, it's uh, it's really interesting. And, and that strategy of pursuit of, of turn, turnkey facilities to, to reduce permitting, I think it's uh, it's a really interesting one. I guess I would follow up on that with, uh, and we you know you touched on it earlier, but obviously COVID transformed. Uh, you know, I mean every every sector pretty much, but food uh, especially was uh, had you. Uh, tumultuous time. And so I, I'm interested to know you know, on the consumer side, I imagine that demand uh, grew and, and it sounds like it has stayed strong since then for food delivery services. Have you seen on the facility side, uh, you know, have there been more facilities become available because uh, you know, restaurant facilities or, or other uh, manufacturing facilities simply weren't able to survive COVID or you know, how did how did that period of time really affect uh, affect your business? Yeah, it was a very scary time for everybody, and it's a very scary time for our members. Um, mm -hmm. Most importantly, for that, uh, we recall the story of one of the first days after the lockdowns were announced. We had our wedding cake. Uh, one of our wedding cake producers come to us and be like, "I lost all my weddings uh, for this year." How am I going to survive and how am I going to do this? So we spent two weeks really focusing on how could we drive value back to the members. That included helping them to pivot their business. It included uh, helping to offer them um, concessions uh, and deferrals on their rent. Um, and uh, we went to our landlords and asked for support, of course, um, as I think everybody else did uh, during that time. And what was really um, inspiring at that time is we went out to all the members and said, if you need support during this time, we can offer you the support and defer your rent. 30% of our members took us up on that offer to a certain degree. 100% of those companies paid us back within six months. Um, because what the exciting thing is, it's potentially those companies weren't thriving at the time. They were surviving, but they survived and they worked hard. Um, and thankfully, the community rallied around small business and was able to succeed, uh, succeed from that. Um, COVID absolutely accelerated it from the delivery only networks, um, but that is not a large section of our business. Um, so as we talk about ghost kitchens, that's about 10% of our business. Uh, and when I'm talking about ghost kitchens, sorry, that is a delivery only uh, model. So if you were sitting at home uh, ordering from one of your favorite local restaurants, it might be coming from our facility itself. That's a small part of our market. We haven't over indexed that for a few reasons. One, it's just one segment. Uh, at Coho, we have over seven different segments of, of food businesses, which makes it like I'm knocking on wood, makes it quite recession uh, resistant. Because if food delivery starts going down a little bit, what you see is catering picking up. So during COVID, for example, uh, catering almost immediately disappeared. But the, but what people were able to pivot to in uh, home cooking, in uh, farmers market products, in packaged goods, and things like that, they were able to help succeed and grow from that uh, side itself. So. COVID um, was definitely an acceleration, but we haven't actually seen a change in behavior on people ordering uh, online food, or at least the demand uh, for the kitchens, uh, sorry, for the businesses that operate within our facility. Um, but we're really strengthened by um, a really uh, diverse set of businesses itself. Um, to answer your one of your, your additional questions around availability of turnkey facilities during that, uh, that didn't happen at COVID. At COVID, I believe that the government did a pretty good job of supporting those local businesses and allowing them to keep going uh, at it. What did start hitting that was any of the recessionary concerns from uh, late last year really started to push some of those conversations. And probably people that hadn't fully recovered from the COVID period um, decided to close shop. 
Um, so at that time, we started to get a whole lot of activity from um, our realtors and from our network saying, hey, I have this facility for you. Uh, we just announced two new locations in East Vancouver. One of those was literally a two-week turnaround of, hey, here's an amazing facility. I got to get out of it. Um, and and it worked out perfectly for us. And again, we had it uh, at capacity at opening. Um, so we just have to keep our eyes uh, on the ground for that constantly um, because that growth and scale, it's like if we can open that location, add another 10 companies, of course that adds revenue and profitability. But what keeps us up at night is if there's those companies sitting on the wait list, uh, first of all, will any competitors pop up um, to help support that that demand? Um, and second of all, um, uh, like where are they uh, operating? Are they not able to like um, go after their dream want to. And that's something that we, of course, from a, a vision standpoint of our company is to help small businesses. So if we can't help those businesses that are just waiting, um, then we're missing that objective. Yeah, really interesting. And and I guess maybe it's it's my ignorance, but when I think of uh, you know, uh, a kitchen model like uh, like Coho, I, I automatically think of, of ghost kitchens, of, of food delivery. Maybe that's because it's uh, you know, maybe the better well-known on the retail side. But I'm, I'm wondering earlier, you mentioned uh, you know, that it's a very competitive industry and you, you've got long wait lists of uh, businesses looking to partner with you. Can you tell us a little bit about what that industry overview looks like in Vancouver you know, uh, or, or nationally? You know, are there a significant number of uh, players in this space? Uh, you know, who are some of the, the people that you kind of index yourself against and, and what are you doing to, you know, to outperform them? Absolutely. And going back to your question a little bit there on the ghost kitchens, ghost kitchens is a new concept. Um, shared kitchens, not a new concept. Um, people offer in these spaces, but doing it at a commercially like high level, um, that is, is something new that we're pushing itself. So as I go into competitors, I'll talk a little bit about there's two different segments. It's the people that are operating the spaces. That's more like us. And then the people that are actually producing the food. Um, both of those get lumped under the same banner of ghost kitchen. Um, and both of them are moving at different paces, um, effectively. So our main competitors, um, that we see in that shared kitchen space. So as far as providing spaces and allowing other people to succeed and grow, um, they're not in Canada. Um, we of course have those businesses in Canada. Um, there are, there's another competitor uh, that's doing a great job in Vancouver, um, that have a few kitchens. Um, and then, uh, across the country, there's individual operators that are operating these things. Um, in North America, there's over 2000 shared kitchens. So it's an opportunity for a roll up down the line, uh, as well, uh, to take, um, some of that opportunity. Um, however, in the rest of the world, this um, industry is has really picked up and is uh, accelerating as well. So the two main competitors that we keep an eye out for, uh, one is called Cloud Kitchens. Cloud Kitchens is started by the founder of Uber, Travis Kalanick. Um, and what they're really focused on is that ghost kitchen sector and working with large scale brands. Um, yeah. They will announce partnerships with national chains. They'll do all of their delivery and they're really focusing on the technology of that platform, but really focusing on that ghost kitchen segment does offer a little bit of challenge um, as their, uh, if, if macroeconomic conditions change. The other kitchen uh, company that's doing quite well in the United States is a company called Kitchen United. Um, they have received their funding and expansion primarily through a nationwide grocery chain in the United States. And as you can imagine, large grocery buildings are looking for ways to uh, innovate their product offerings uh, to their customers. Um, but they also have hundreds of thousands of square feet to fill. Um, so they're starting to take little pods uh, within those facilities and they're going to be able to scale through that. Again, primarily focused on that ghost kitchen or immediate delivery to the, the grocery customer that's around rather than focusing on that wider diverse uh, range. Um, and then you'll hear about some other different companies operating in the ghost kitchen companies. For example, Katopi um, is one based um, in Europe, in the Middle East. Uh, Reef is based um, worldwide. Those companies are um, very strong presence in the ghost kitchen segment, but they're producing the products themselves. Um, okay. these businesses can scale a whole lot faster because you can take all over defunct restaurants and things like that. And all you have to do is come up with your four or five brands, produce it in one kitchen and deliver it out. Those are the ones that people primarily hear about when they hear ghost kitchens. Um, yeah. the only challenge with that business is that the margins are operating at a 
lower than a restaurant margin. Um, and the reason for that is because, um, like, I mean, of course the delivery network, they can only, they, they lose money in licensing fees, things like that. Um, but they're able to go faster just with a smaller margin, whereas we are able to grow a little bit slower, um, but with a very strong margin that's able to help, um, uh, deliver that. We actually have some of those companies operating in our space. So we essentially have companies that are renting space in ours and then doing that kind of larger scale delivery network, which is perfect for everybody. So, I mean, competition exists out there. Um, and our shared kitchen models really differentiate because we support that diverse range of customers. Uh, and really, I think what holds them sticky is the the customer service that we're able to provide them at the end of the day, the technology that empowers it. We really look for every friction point from working in a shared environment. You can imagine working in a shared office environment. There's enough things that could like get in your way and be distracting to your your business. You can imagine that if you're actually in a kitchen, uh, you've probably been in the kitchen with your partner trying to get things done. It's hard. Imagine 30 or 40 partners surrounded you uh, also wanting and driving the focus of their business. So really it's about us is understanding our customers, offering some supportive, flexible spaces and really giving them that community that can, they can flourish because it's uh it can be lonely being an entrepreneur. Uh, so to being around like-minded individuals while challenging at times, um, can also be really empowering for people to help them grow. Amazing. Yeah. It's, it's a really interesting overview of the industry and, and far more complex than, uh, than at least I, I was aware of, but I think you, your numbers do the talking for you. You said 98%. Uh, of your customers have, have stuck by you. And I think that's uh, that's really an incredible number. So I'd, I'd like to, to move on to uh, your, your recent acquisition. So uh, you, you've you discussed some growth of the business through uh, you know, the opening of new locations, uh, but purebred, you know, this is uh, you know, obviously a, a very well-known brand when I visited Vancouver, you know, earlier in the year, it was the first place, uh, you know, my friend who lives there brought me and, you know, personally, I, I probably spent a good 10 or 15 minutes deciding what of the multitude of delicious, uh, treats were, were available, but you know, I, I'm interested to know, obviously, you know, the backstory behind that acquisition, but you know, is this, uh, a pivot to, you know, a different kind of direction for the business? Are you going to be pursuing more uh, acquisitions like that, or are you going to be moving more into that space, or you know, is this purebred really fit within the shared kitchen model that you currently operate? Yeah, very good question. Um, so I, I mentioned beforehand, but Co stands for community and hospitality. We are in the hospitality business and delivering that amazing service to our members and customers alike. Right now, fifty percent of our revenue is from retail business, uh, retail portions of our business already. We have a beautiful restaurant on the front of one of our commissary locations. We have a, uh, a small food hall that's on, on the, the, sorry, on the front of another, uh, location. We're looking for ways to get out to those customers. And, um, ultimately our vision is to supercharge food businesses. Um, this business started as a farmer's market brand, purebred, um, 15 years ago. Um, and they quickly moved to a central production model. So in 2018, they opened a production facility very similar to Coho's, uh, and they service their own uh, individual bakeries itself. So how we see those two growing together is uh, one is we can be co-located within facilities, um, whether they are operating the retail front um, or whether they are using our production facilities as we expand into um, the rest of the country. Uh, so what we are really looking from a, from an investment thesis is finding businesses that support that whole value chain all the way from the customer buying the food all the way to the farmer. Anything through that that can help the, the process move faster. So here it's about supporting a, a business that um, has built an amazing and beloved brand and helping them to take it to that next level of course, for the benefit of all of our, our, of our shareholders as well. Um, but we can also be looking for any acquisitions that are around that, uh, that whole value chain that provides uh, food all the way from farmer to your plate. Um, really, it can be seen as a strategic move that aligns with our growth and expansion plans. Uh, they have, uh, Purebred had a national expansion plan very much aligned to what Coho's is. So to do that together just makes sense. Um, why we are why we were interested in it, as you said about it, if you are from um, or visited uh, the West Coast, you know what they deliver. Uh, just to give you give the 
the listeners or the watchers, um, uh, viewers, uh, the idea of what it's like to walk into this experience. So um, it's one of the most beloved coffee and bakery businesses in Vancouver. When you walk through the door, you're going to be immediately overwhelmed by the amount of products that are served there. Um, they have over 150 SKUs that they produce, like that they bake at the back. Every day, there can be over 75 items on there. So imagine how many different uh, options you get. And as you said, it it's, can be a little bit challenging. You go in for one uh, croissant and you end up with a box of six things because everything looks just so good. Um, and it's just that sensory experience. And then they knock it out of the park with their customer service. Their staff um, are also um, uh, love these uh, products itself. Um, at some of their locations, they have lines out um, the cafe. So for Whistler, for example, you can wait half an hour, 45 minutes just to get in to order, um, a pastry. And that really stands and, and people come back day after day, uh, to have that really shows, um, that brand and, um, uh, how beloved their, their audience is uh, of them. Excuse me. Um, from a pure business and financial angle, it also made a whole lot of sense. Um, so they uh, built their business over 15 years. They're now doing over $10 million of annual revenue um, at a very strong margin. They're over a 17% EBITDA margin, which is uh, kind of unheard of uh, within this space as well, largely supported by their central hub and spoke model, which we can even make better uh, from that. Uh, and they have a 22% character themselves. They're growing. They believe uh, in, in the growth of their business. Um, and we are very proud of what they've built. And we just hope that we can represent them well as we continue to expand them across uh, the country itself. Um, ultimately, what does that mean for Coho and, and our investors effectively? And our, our thesis is we're going to be constantly looking to expand that product portfolio, for the lack of a better word, um, and our revenue mix. We want to find a way that um, uh, despite any challenges, despite any challenges with speed, we can continue to provide value back to our customers and our shareholders alike. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of operational efficiencies in any of these transactions. Um, so Coho was built and we went public. So uh, we have, of course, built a finance team and a marketing team to support that vision. Um, we have thankfully have a very strong team there that can help provide that immediate impact to purebred who don't have that strong arm right now. They are very strong operationally, um, but not ready for that scale um, that we can help provide them. And then there's going to be a ton of cross-marketing opportunities. Coho is a very strong beloved business ourselves in that sm small food entrepreneur community. Um, but if you're not a food producer, like we are a B2B business. The great thing about purebred is everybody in Vancouver has heard about it. Uh, so from a expansion opportunity, from a front facing opportunity, and of course, from an investor, a retail investor perspective, um, we're hoping that the story comes across quite strongly. Yeah. It sounds like there were a multitude of benefits to this deal in terms of growing the business and, and maybe some uh, synergies between purebred and, and coho You're, what does that mean i guess for uh both current shareholders and your prospective investors you know what is the the new investment thesis now that uh you know purebred is a part of coho yeah i guess the first thing to say is that we've focused a lot on this deal to make sure it made sense for everybody um both ourselves invest uh, but the, the vendors themselves and the investor um, so the deal was structured that the majority of the purchase price, um, was being supported by senior debt, um, so that we can dilute, um, our existing, uh, shareholders as, as little as possible. Uh, despite the dilution that we will see, um, we know that there's immediate accretive value based on the revenue and profit that they bring, uh, to the business itself. Um, we can, we can, and intend to grow both businesses aggressively against that. So right now we have nine locations. We believe that Coho does. Uh, we believe that we can expand that to over 16 by the end of 2026. Um, Purebred has six locations, and we believe that we can get that to over 20 locations by 2026 based on the speed uh, that it's able to be there. Uh, buying revenue forecast that we put together for that three-year period um, takes us to over $58 million of revenue in that time. So more than tripling the revenue um, versus what we will see at the end of 2023. Uh, so that what I would hope that the investor is seeing is that we are uh, looking constantly to reinvent our business, uh, focus on what's going on in the economy right now, look and ultimately find those 
the people that are uncompromising about delivering amazing quality and customer experience. If you can do that and you've proven that you can do it um, profitably, um, it's really a winning combination. And that's what we're really seeing in Purebred as well as in any other transactions that we're looking at is people that have done things very well and they just need, they're either ready to step away um, or they just need support to help grow and scale and expand. And thankfully we have that muscle and we're just ready to use it. Yeah, amazing. I think uh, sounds like there's some really uh, ambitious growth opportunities and, and I for one am, am fully on board with an expansion of, of Purebred and, and hope there's a location coming near me soon. Uh, I'm wondering uh, you know, if you have any kind of closing remarks, you know, anything that you maybe haven't discussed that you feel uh, that uh, investors should know when, when looking at the Coho story. Absolutely. So when we went public, we had three locations. We currently have nine locations. Um, we decided to do this because it's an important mission that we're on. Uh, and we need, of course, the capital support to, to chase that uh, mission down. Um, why we are doing the transaction is that we really believe it's going to provide that additional revenue stream, market op opportunity, solidity to the business that will help us to expand from there. Um, retail investors now have the opportunity to invest in that combined um, business, as I talked about, that we are very excited about the, the numbers behind it. Um, also, I mean, speaking very directly, retail investors have a chance to be owners of Purebred. Um, and that's something that will probably resonate very strongly with those that... Um, uh, know the brand and know its potential. Um, our three-year visions for the combined businesses, they're going to be operating as individual businesses. We're not getting rid of names. They're very both very strong in their own segments itself. Um, is all around expanding and expanding responsibly to maintain the quality that we have. Um, so uh, there's definitely market expansion across Canada. We are the biggest player and the fastest growing shared kitchen company in Canada. That is not to be debated. Uh, within the purebred space itself, because they are so uncompromising about their quality, you can go in there and guarantee good food. And that's just something that all, all consumers are demanding these days. There's so many choices. And the reason that they have lines out the street is because people see their commitment to the quality. So we'll do that, expand that across the country itself, open more locations, and then support uh, through different revenue streams. Um, so for example, both of us right now don't do a ton of, um, uh, wholesale activity. Um, but we get approached all the time from our uh, relationships and um, partners to ask us, hey, could you do this thing to uh, help uh, drive additional revenue to their businesses? And it's something that we can now um, uh, clue in on. And then finally, we have to keep an eye on the community very strongly. Uh, that's what our business was built on, was helping support the businesses that operate in our space and growing ours, our own at the exact same time. So really understanding what the consumer is thinking, relaying that to our, our customers to help them grow, and then just consist, consistently find a way to help both businesses grow. With with Coho at a 59% CAGR, and right now Purebred at 20%, 22%, um, both are exceptionally um, strong growing businesses. Um, so what I would hope that the entrepreneur, I'm sorry, that the investor sees is the opportunity ahead. It's really a blue sky world that we're working in right now. Uh, and we believe that we are at the forefront of that growth. And this um, acquisition itself makes a huge step forward into our opportunity. Okay, amazing. Well, uh, you, Andrew Balls, Bonds, CEO of uh, Coho Collective Kitchens. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time to chat with me today. Thank you.